Thank you. We turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlow. Uh, presiding officer, the Health Secretary has now ordered government officials to go into Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board to find out what has gone wrong at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. So can I ask what progress has been made? Can the First Minister set out how many individual cases of infection between 2016 and 2019 government officials have now identified? And if not, can she set out whether it is substantially more than the figures about which we already know? First Minister. Um, well, in terms of uh, the first part of Jackson Carlow's question, uh, since the Health Secretary's announcement last Friday uh, about the escalation of the oversight of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, particularly around the areas of infection prevention and control and communication with patients and families, an oversight uh, board has been established. Uh, that oversight board is chaired by the Chief Nursing Officer, Professor Fiona McQueen. It met yesterday and it confirmed that it will focus on three key areas, infection prevention and control, clinical governance and patient and family communication. And as appropriate, of course, uh, the Health Secretary will keep Parliament updated on the progress of its work. In terms of the second part of Jackson Carlaw's question, uh, I should say there is work uh, ongoing with uh, Health Protection Scotland to make sure uh, we fully uh, are aware of uh, numbers of infections. Uh, following uh, previous uh, claims that were made uh, around an internal clinician-led review, uh, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, confirmed to the Scottish Government that uh, in uh, 2017, uh, the, uh, were 26 organisms uh, identified in 14 children um, and uh, 14 children affected, but there is other work ongoing in terms of the other years uh, that have been affected. Jackson Carlow may be aware, I'm sure is aware, of the Health Protection Scotland report that was published uh, this week, which is a technical report, but nevertheless uh, provides some important information. Uh, the last point I would make, uh, obviously, in terms of providing not just information, uh, but proper investigation and assurance about the situation at the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, Lord Brodie has been confirmed this morning as the chair of the public inquiry, and the Health Secretary will have discussions with him about the precise remit of the public inquiry before the Christmas break. Jackson Carla. Yes, can I welcome the appointment of Lord Brodie, but obviously the circumstances and conditions in the hospital are such that there is obviously urgent, uh, urgent questions we need to ask in action that needs to take place just now, and, and I'm pleased to hear about the Oversight Board. Um, at the weekend, the Health Secretary was asked about the clinical report into infections at the Sick Kids Hospital in 2017, revealed by a whistleblower now two weeks ago. And as the First Minister said, this is a clinician-led report which revealed that 26 infections affected 14 sick children in that year. Now, on Sunday, the Health Secretary said she had seen some of the report, but not all of it. So can I ask the First Minister whether she and the Health Secretary have now got the full report on their desk and whether they have had time to read it now in full and whether, in fact, any action has followed from that as a result? First Minister. Uh, the Oversight Board, as I understand it now, it has all of the information uh, that uh, is contained in what has been described as uh, a report uh, that was clinically led. Uh, and let me just be very clear, the uh, Oversight Board uh, will be, as part of the work it's been doing, uh, gathering all uh, data together from 2015 so that it can establish uh, confidently uh, the number of different uh, bugs uh, and the number of cases of infections as well as the number of children affected. That is important work, but I, I'm sure Jackson Carlaw will appreciate, I hope he will appreciate, that it is important that we do that work rigorously and accurately so that the information uh, that is provided, uh, we have confidence in. So that work is ongoing, and as I said in my earlier answer, uh, Parliament will be kept updated as appropriate. The wider issues, of course, will be for the public inquiry to consider uh, once it gets underway. Jackson Carl. Again, thank you for that. But also in the weekend's press, we read reports that in addition to the 26 infections in 2017, uh, the whistleblower had identified a further 10 infections uh, cases the year before. Now, like everything else in this scandal, it seems we have to wait for reports to emerge in the press before finding out what has actually been going on. What has the Scottish Government done in the four days since those claims surfaced to examine whether in fact they are accurate? And is it the case that infection incidents were indeed being reported as far back as 2016? And if so, shouldn't that perhaps have set alarm bells ringing? First Minister. Uh, well, the Health Protection uh, Scotland report that I referred to earlier on, I, I should say it is a very technical report, but it points to the periods, including specific months, where it has identified uh, what it calls spikes in infections. It should say it uh, 
has said that the infection rates right now uh, are not uh, abnormal uh, or above what would be expected. But in terms of the, the detailed questions that Jackson Carlaw is asking, that is exactly what the oversight uh, board, with assistance as appropriate from Health Protection Scotland, is seeking to establish so that we are uh, confident that there is no uh, under-reporting of numbers of infection and there's no duplication uh, in the, the figures that are uh, being reported. And that work is ongoing um, and uh, will be taken forward uh, as quickly as possible. Um, in terms of information coming from whistleblowers, let me just say as an aside, uh, whistleblowers uh, who come forward with information like this uh, do a service to patient safety in the NHS and should always uh, be treated uh, appropriately. Um, but I would say to, I, I know the Health Secretary will uh, meet with uh, two whistleblowers, I think, uh, next week. Anybody who feels they have information uh, that should be brought to the attention of the Scottish Government or now the Oversight Board should come forward uh, and come forward directly to the Health Secretary if necessary so that we can be absolutely clear that all information has been treated uh, properly uh, with respect and being investigated appropriately. Jackson Carla. Well, thank you, and I hope that they do. I mean, last week I said that this issue is now about trust. Now, parents and patients are waiting for answers and need some clarity from the government on exactly what has happened at the hospital. The priority has been to be providing the truth to the families, who, as we've learned in recent weeks, have only discovered the facts thanks to whistleblowers and leaks to newspapers. Now, the First Minister and the Health Secretary are still asking for time to answer some of the key questions which remain unanswered. And I appreciate that she has in instructed the Oversight Board to report. But how much longer will patients and parents have to wait? When will these answers be available? The government has now put itself in charge. So when will the First Minister and her Health Secretary be able to respond? First Minister. Um, firstly, I, I absolutely understand uh, that parents in particular, uh, but actually the wider public as well, want to have uh, information and answers to any uh, reasonable, legitimate question that there is here. I, I want that too. Uh, but it is important that the information that is provided is uh, robust information that has been properly investigated. Um, anybody who does read the Health Protection Scotland report that was published this week uh, will get an understanding of how complex some of these issues are. That is no comfort to parents whose children are affected, but in terms of understanding uh, the types of infection, the numbers of infection, the number of cases and the number of children uh, affected, it is important that that work is done uh, properly. Uh, the government is absolutely committed to making sure that there is absolute transparency around all of this. That is why uh, Health Protection Scotland and the Healthcare Environment Scotland are, are both involved in this. It's why the independent review was established, which of course will report, we hope, early next year. It's why the public inquiry has also uh, been announced with the chair, of course, appointed today and why this oversight board is now uh, working. So this is extremely important that that transparency is there, but that the information being provided is accurate and robust. And that is what we are committed to doing. The health secretary is intending to make an update statement to parliament before the Christmas recess in order that uh, parliament can be fully appraised of the progress of this work with any timescales that are flowing from that. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could the First Minister tell us when she last discussed delays to toxicology and post-mortem reports with the Lord Advocate? First Minister. Uh, I have had uh, briefings from the Lord Advocate over uh, recent weeks and, and months. Uh, about these kind of issues. I would have to go back and check exactly the detail uh, of those issues, but I'm very happy to uh, do so and report back to Richard uh, Leonard once I've had that opportunity. Richard Leonard. Uh, First Minister, um, are you aware of the backlog of delays uh, in reports uh, from the uh, Glasgow University, which is um, in an arrangement with the Crown Office, but is currently in a contractual dispute with the Crown Office over the provision of toxicology services. This is a matter of public interest and it is also a matter of public concern and it is bereaved families who are paying the price. Families like brother and sister Gary and Emma from Lanarkshire, uh, their mum Susan died suddenly at the end of May this year. They are grieving the loss of a much loved mother and a much missed grandmother. But instead of getting answers to give them some closure and some peace, 
They have been waiting 26 weeks for a final post-mortem report, and they are still waiting. They have received a standard six-weekly letter three times. The Crown Office says that a contractual dispute is to blame, but that's no consolation to Gary and Emma, who have told us that their mum's life insurance won't pay out without a death certificate. And so they are being chased by a mortgage lender threatening repossession of the family home. And they could and they should have been spared this deep anxiety, this additional uncertainty and this unnecessary pain. So First Minister, will you take the opportunity today to apologise to Gary and Emma and to all of those bereaved families across Scotland who have been going through the same ordeal? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, take the opportunity to put on record my uh, deepest condolences to the family uh, whose situation has been raised by Richard Leonard. Um, beyond what Richard Leonard has told me, obviously, I, I am not familiar with the detail of uh, that case, but I would be very happy to look into that. I'm sure the, the Justice Secretary and or the Lord Advocate, as appropriate, would be happy uh, to meet with or correspond with that family. On the substantive issue that Richard Leonard uh, has raised, uh, there has been an issue with the Glasgow uh, contract. Um, the, there has now been an agreement to extend uh, that contract to allow these issues uh, to be resolved in the short term. Uh, longer term, uh, the Crown Office is considering uh, the future of that service and, and whether it continues, uh, if it cannot continue to be performed by uh, Glasgow University, what the appropriate arrangements uh, for that are in the future. That's the issue, as I said in my earlier uh, answer to Richard Leonard, the Lord Advocate has been keeping me uh, briefed on and if there are uh, more details that I can usefully uh, make available to Richard Leonard uh, about the, the generality of the issue as well as in the individual case, I'd be very happy to do so. Richard Leonard. Well, this facility at Glasgow University uh, that deals with sudden and unexpected deaths also handles 90% of suspected drug-related deaths in Scotland. Now, the First Minister is well aware that Scotland is in the grip of a drug death emergency. So the First Minister must also be aware of the key role that this unit plays in informing the allocation of resources to prevent future drug deaths. First Minister, this is a public service which you are responsible for. This dispute is something which you can resolve. The damage done is not just financial, it is human. So will you step up? Will you step in? Will you find a resolution to this long-running contractual dispute for the sake of our public health, for the sake of preventing future drug deaths, and for the sake of these grieving families? First Minister. Um, look, these are important issues, and I, I, I don't uh, demur for that, uh, from that for a, a second. Uh, these services are vital. There has been uh, a contractual dispute. I, I don't think it would be possible or appropriate or helpful for me to uh, get into the reasons underlying uh, that right now. But the Crown Office and Glasgow University, just to be clear, uh, have been working together uh, to manage the transition to a new provider uh, for these uh, services. Uh, that is obviously a priority for the Crown Office. It's a priority for uh, the Scottish uh, Government because we understand the importance of having these services in place. Toxicology services play a vital role within the justice system, but also in terms of investigation of drugs-related uh, deaths. Uh, so these issues are extremely important. In terms of uh, my involvement, as I said, the Lord Advocate is keeping me updated uh, on this, uh, but these issues have uh, a priority, uh, priority attention from the Lord Advocate and the Crown Office. And as I say, if there is more information that I can helpfully provide to Richard Leonard or others in the Chamber with an interest in this, I would be very happy to do so and to keep him updated as these uh, discussions proceed. Thank you. We've got a number of uh, constituency supplementary questions. The first from Peter Chapman, to be followed by Anas Sarwar. Peter Chapman. Hi, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, one of my constituents, Mr Watson, raised, has raised a serious issue around waiting times for dermatology department at the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. Mr Watson attended his GP two years ago and was diagnosed with a basal sar sarcinoma near his eye. After diagnosis, he then had to wait a full year to see a specialist within the department who informed him that he would need surgery on the surrounding area. 
He's been waiting a further 10 months and no treatment has been received. So nearly two years later, First Minister, nothing has been done. And a second lesion has now appeared on his ear. This breaches numerous waiting times targets on cancer treatment and referral and is totally unacceptable. Do you agree? And what is being done to address this scandalous situation? First Minister. Well, firstly, um, from what Peter Chapman has uh, recounted to the Chamber, yes, I do agree that is not an acceptable uh, wait for Mr Watson. I would, uh, through Peter Chapman, convey my best wishes to him. Uh, the Health Secretary will be very happy to look into the individual case if uh, Peter Chapman wants to provide the details uh, of his constituent to us. More generally, as uh, Peter Chapman will be aware, uh, we have the uh, £850 million waiting times improvement programme underway um, to make sure that as demand for healthcare services rises in Scotland as elsewhere, uh, the health service is building the capacity to meet that demand. Uh, but we'd be very happy to look into Mr Watson's case. And I saw our to be filled by <coughs> Angela Constance. President officer, two weeks ago I reviewed details of a child's death at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital due to contaminated water. More damning evidence has now been shared with me. The evidence shows that the health board knew the water was contaminated when it was transferred from the contractor to the health board. A report done the week the hospital was opened revealed that the water supply was not safe and there was a high risk of infections. Months before Millie died, Infection control doctors raised concerns about line infections in the children's cancer ward. Three weeks before Millie died, infection control doctors alerted management of further concerns about infections, escalated this to Health Protection Scotland and the Scottish Government and requested testing of the water. A month after Millie's death, another assessment of the water supply was done, which again found the water supply was not safe and said there was still a high risk of infections. At each of these stages, these warnings were ignored and the appropriate action was not taken. It led to the death of at least one child. If this happened in the private sector, there wouldn't be a public inquiry, there would be a criminal investigation. First Minister, what did you, your ministers and officials know and when? Who will take responsibility and be held accountable for this? Because be in no doubt, I and many others will not rest until we get justice and answers for Millie's parents and all the parents of the children affected. First Minister. Well, can I, can I thank Anna Sarwar for uh, again raising this issue and uh, giving him an assurance that the Scottish Government is determined uh, to get the answers that uh, Millie's parents and parents of any uh, children who have been treated at the Queen Elizabeth uh, want and deserve. Um, I am not uh, aware of what uh, evidence Anna Sarwar is citing today. I would uh, encourage him to share that uh, with us. Uh, when I say I'm not aware of it, I haven't seen specifically what he is uh, citing in the chamber today. If I can see that, then obviously I'll be able to uh, look at that, as will the Health Secretary, to see whether it is information the Scottish Government's already had or whether it's information the Scottish Government is not aware of. Uh, the reason we have ordered the public inquiry is to make sure that in addition to all of the work uh, that has been done, that there is complete transparency uh, and, if necessary, complete accountability um, around these issues. Uh, and as Sarwar referred to uh, criminal investigations, clearly it is not my uh, job uh, and it's not uh, for me to uh, direct criminal investigations, but it is my job to make sure that the Scottish Government takes all appropriate action to get to uh, the bottom of all of these issues. And that's what I and the Health Secretary are determined to do. Thank you. Angela Constance to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister has taken a keen interest in my constituents uh, affected by a death abroad and I, I warmly welcome the commitment in the SNP manifesto to press the next UK Government to implement uh, all the recommendations in the recent report by the all-party political group on deaths abroad and consular services. However, some of the recommendations in that report are Scotland specific so will the First Minister commit to implementing those recommendations where she has the power to do so, of course? First Minister. Uh, where uh, the Scottish Government has the power to act here, we will certainly uh, do everything that we can to take forward uh, the recommendations. I 
uh, welcome the work of the All Party Parliamentary Group on deaths abroad. Um, I think the work that's come out of that is uh, very uh, helpful and productive to allow us to make sure progress has been made on these issues. Uh, so the Scottish Government will do what we can within our powers. We will also continue to press relevant UK government departments, uh, agency services, or in some cases third party organisations uh, to recognise the issues are, uh, involved here and make sure that they are taking the action uh, that is required as well. And uh, we will, in summary, press for all of the recommendations in the All-Party Parliamentary Group report to be implemented. Lee MacArthur to be followed by John Finney. Thanks very much, Chair. Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the recent BBC programme highlighting environmental impacts of meat production in the US and South America. Does she share the concern of many farmers in Orkney and in farming communities across the country that this programme made little or no attempt to explain the vast differences between massively intensive American livestock production and practices here in the UK, which generally adhere to much higher environmental and animal welfare standards? And does she agree with the leaders of the four main uh, UK farming unions that such one-sided partial portrayals of the agriculture sector, quote, do nothing to help people make informed choices about food which can be grown and reared in ways that offer benefits to the environment? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do agree. Uh, I do agree very strongly uh, with those comments. I have not yet had the opportunity myself to see the programme, but I've heard these concerns that have been raised about it, about the, uh, its uh, inability to uh, draw the distinctions and uh, make the differences that Liam MacArthur has referred to. Clearly, there are environmental challenges uh, for our own uh, sector here, but uh, I think it is really important that we recognise the quality uh, of that and the work that has been done and not allow uh, lazy reporting to uh, sort of impugn the integrity of... Uh, the sector here uh, with practices elsewhere that we would all deplore. So I uh, thank Liam MacArthur for raising what is an important issue. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, in response to a Scottish Government consultation on short-term lets, Highland Council reported 8,000 people needing a home. The Scottish Government's own research showed that 20, nearly 20% 20 of the houses on the island of Skye are now Airbnb lets. A month ago, First Minister, um, promised uh, my colleague Alison Johnson the Scottish Government would publish its response to the consultation before the end of the year. With nine sitting days left, can the First Minister advise what measures the Scottish Government is considering and when members are likely to see proposals for much needed regulation in the short term letting sector? First Minister. Uh, well, we are committed to uh, seeing better regulation in this sector because we understand the pressures in particular areas uh, of the country here in Edinburgh, for example, and in the areas uh, that John Finney has mentioned in his own region. Uh, the uh, date in which we will publish that consultation, I will provide to John Finney. I don't have the specific date uh, in front of me right now. Uh, more generally, of course, the Scottish Government is investing heavily in uh, house supply, uh, homes supply, um, in terms of increasing uh, the availability of good quality homes available to people. And that work is uh, work that we are determined to take forward at pace. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Two weeks ago, the Justice Secretary, Hamza Youssef, said he was very satisfied with the support provided to police officers. This week, new research found that just 3% of police officers believe Police Scotland really cares about their health and well-being. Just 3%. Does Hamza Youssef know what's going on? First Minister. Um, I, I think, and I hope Willie Rennie uh, would accept this, we all care. We all care deeply about the health and well-being of our police officers. Um, I certainly do. I absolutely believe Willie Rennie does, Hamza Yousaf does. We all do because we know the exceptional job that police officers do day in and day out. By coincidence, of course, uh, the Police Bravery Awards uh, will take place later today. Um, and I would take this opportunity to put on record my gratitude and appreciation to and appreciation of our police officers at the length and breadth of the country. Uh, mental uh, health support um, and support for well-being is extremely important within Police Scotland. Uh, police officers and police staff can access a range of services uh, to care for both their physical and mental health, uh, including through Police Scotland's Your Wellbeing Matters programme. Uh, police Scotland is one of the first police services in the UK to implement mental health and suicide intervention training for all officers. Uh, the Scottish Government is providing funding to extend the Lifeline Scotland Wellbeing programme to blue light responders, including uh, the police. 
Uh, Police Scotland launched the Wellbeing uh, Programme uh, back in 2017, which includes the introduction of Wellbeing uh, Champions. Um, and a force-wide Wellbeing and Engagement Survey will be launched early next year. So uh, I am not standing here uh, at all and saying that there is not more we should always be looking to do to support uh, those public sector workers like police officers on the front line. Uh, but we all care about their health and well-being and that is reflected on the action that has been taken and the support that is available. William Rennie. The, the question I asked was, does the Justice Secretary know what's going on? And the First Minister refused to answer the question. Because how, how, can, how can anybody be satisfied when just 3% of officers feel that Police Scotland really cares? How can he be satisfied with that woeful position? The Justice Secretary is out of touch whilst our police officers are struggling. Because look at the research. This is new research. It found that one in 10 police officers turned to alcohol or prescription drugs to cope. One in 10. Almost half suffer from exhaustion. And this is the most devastating of all. One third of officers are turning up to work mentally unwell. A third turning up to work mentally unwell. How can anybody be satisfied with that position? That's the men and women of our police sacrificing their mental health to keep us all safe. In Callum Steele, the General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation, told me that these findings were frightening. Frightening. That's what he told me. So why has the welfare of our police in Scotland gone so horribly wrong? Will she answer that question? First Minister. Well, firstly, nobody, um, not me, not Hamza Youssef, uh, not anybody I would imagine in this chamber is uh, satisfied at all if police officers or nurses or any public sector workers uh, are reporting that they don't feel as supported as they uh, want to be in their job and government has a duty. Uh, to respond to that. Much of what I uh, said in response to my earlier answer sets out the action that the Scottish Government is taking and will continue to take uh, to make sure that we are doing everything we can to support our frontline police officers. Of course, one of the other things that we have done uh, to support frontline police officers is ensure that there are a thousand more police officers working in Scotland uh, than there were uh, when this Government took office. And I would also say to Willie Rennie that we did that uh, during uh, the very period, or we have sustained that during the very period that the Liberal Democrats were helping the Tories to impose austerity on our budget. And leading, of course, leading, of course, to a situation in England uh, where 20,000 police officers uh, were cut yeah. from service. Uh, it's because of the actions of this government uh, that there continues to be a thousand more police officers in Scotland. That demonstrates we will always work to support the police officers of Scotland who do such a fantastic job day in and day out. Thank you. There's quite a few supplementary questions. Liam Kerr to be followed by Julian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, a significant case review was published into the Dundee Law Killer. Amongst a number of damning conclusions, it exposed terrifying flaws where officials believed he was playing the system and had psychopathic tendencies which increased the likelihood of future violent reoffending. Linda MacDonald, the victim of a brutal attack by this violent criminal whilst he was on home leave, has said that this cannot be allowed to happen again. She's right. Does the First Minister agree with Linda MacDonald that the time has come to look at giving judges the option to put the worst criminals in prison for the rest of their lives? First Minister. Well, can I uh, first of all acknowledge the bravery of Mrs MacDonald um, in this case and uh, I would extend again my uh, deepest sympathy to her and of course to the family of uh, Robbie McIntosh's first victim. Uh, the significant case review here was a, a very important exercise. It found that the attack on Mrs MacDonald couldn't have been predicted, that Robbie McIntosh alone was responsible for that. Uh, nevertheless, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Prison Service are committed to learning from all of the findings 
of the report and will build on actions already taken. For example, the SPS have already implemented improvements to their risk assessment and progression processes and uh, also delivered uh, new training. Uh, so we will take forward all of the recommendations and take forward uh, all of them uh, seriously. Um, in terms of whole life uh, sentences, uh, Mrs Macdonald has uh, written to me on this issue and I pay tribute to her for doing so. I have said to her uh, that I will never close my mind to any suggestions that are about keeping uh, the people of Scotland safe. Uh, however, as I've pointed out uh, to the member before and to others in this chamber, it is possible for a judge, if a judge considers it appropriate, to po impose an, a punishment part uh, of a sentence that extends beyond the natural life uh, of a prisoner. That indeed happened in the World's End uh, case. Uh, it's also the case that when a punishment part of a sentence expires, it is for the parole board to decide whether it is safe to release somebody uh, from prison. So these are the arrangements in place, uh, but in the interests of uh, victims of crime like Mrs Macdonald, who has shown exceptional bravery in this, the Scottish Government will always consider uh, what more uh, can be done to make sure that we are keeping people across Scotland uh, safe. Gillian Martin to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, President Officer. This week is a strange student solidarity week. Can I ask the First Minister what's been done in our colleges and universities of Scotland to support estranged students who have no parental support? First Minister. Well, we are very committed uh, to ensuring that all students, including estranged students, have the same opportunities. Um, in response to the student support review, we've increased and expanded access to further and higher education bursaries. Estranged students in higher education have access to a minimum income of £7,750 through a combination of bursaries and loans, and students in further uh, education can access a maximum bursary of £4,500. Um, I am conscious of the excellent campaign from the charity Stand Alone, uh, working, uh, of course, with Gillian Martin to extend the care experience bursary to estranged, estranged students, and I can uh, tell the Chamber today that we are looking at that issue, and once we've had the opportunity to consider it fully, uh, we'll report back as quickly as possible. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Graeme Simpson. I know the First Minister doesn't travel on my local train service to Dumbarton, Helensburgh or Balloch, because if she did, she would know that the trains are regularly cancelled or delayed, they arrive at rush hour with three carriages instead of six, and it's standing room only for passengers crammed in like sardines. Stop skipping is back, and passengers are being left stranded at stations far away from home. And to add insult to injury, prices continue to rise whilst the service continues to get worse. Can I ask the First Minister, when will she come down on the side of passengers rather than protecting the really poor service from Abellio? First Minister. Uh, well, the Scottish Government always acts uh, to seek the improvements to services that passengers deserve. Um, Abellio have an obligation to make sure that they are tackling and they are tackling uh, the issues that Jackie Bailey uh, has described and it is absolutely right and proper that they do so. Of course, uh, consideration of the future of that franchise uh, will continue um, in line with the requirements that we work within, but I make uh, no bones about expecting uh, Abellio to deliver the improvements that passengers uh, deserve and that Scottish taxpayers uh, pay handsomely for. Graeme Simpson to be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I was contacted by a 72-year-old constituent in East Kilbride, Matthew Rogers. Uh, Matthew worked for 50 years as a nurse in the NHS, retiring at the age of 67. He has osteoarthritis and has been in pain for 15 years. He's been told he needs a new hip. He's also received a letter saying the treatment time guarantee has been missed and he's got no idea when he'll be treated. I visited him on Sunday and asked to see any correspondence he's had. So he crawled upstairs and crawled back down backwards. Mr. Rogers told me, I'm at the stage where my life is totally on hold. I suffer daily. We're considering using the money we've set aside for our funerals to pay for treatment. That is difficult to bear. So what can the First Minister say to Mr. Rogers and thousands like him for whom the treatment time guarantee has proved worthless. First Minister. Well, in respect of Mr Rogers, uh, as I say, whenever an individual case is raised in this chamber, the Health Secretary is happy to look into that if details are provided. I would uh, thank Mr Rogers for his service to the NHS. Uh, but this is, of course, not just about individual cases raised in the chamber. In terms of patients across Scotland, uh, the reason uh, that we have embarked upon the waiting times improvement plan, uh, backed by the 
uh, substantial resources, the £850 million, is because we recognise the increasing demand on our health services and we are determined to support health boards, build the capacity to meet that demand. And that work is underway and uh, the Health Secretary and I, of course, uh, monitor that work closely and carefully and will continue to do so. Ross Greer to be followed by George Adam. Thank you. Tomorrow is the next youth strike for COIMA. I look forward to joining a number of my constituents at George Square in, in Glasgow. The First Minister has told many of these young climate activists that the Scottish Government and her party are leading the world in tackling the climate emergency. If that's the case, why did Greenpeace's independent assessment of Westminster manifestos on the climate and nature emergency published today put the SNP below even the Conservatives and above only the Brexit party? First Minister? Well, actually, for many of the reasons that people keep saying to me, because most of these issues are the responsibility of the Scottish Government. That's why we're getting on in doing it. That's why it's not a matter for our Westminster manifesto. It's a matter for the job of the Scottish Government. I mean, you know, anybody uh, can look at the target. We've, we've set the most ambitious targets anywhere in the world um, in terms of reducing emissions. Uh, we have gone beyond the UK government. Uh, we are taking actions that are way beyond not just other governments in the UK, but most other governments across the world and will continue to do so. Um, I'm looking forward to taking part in the Channel 4 uh, leaders debate on climate change this evening at uh, the last uh, point at which I uh, was updated in this, Boris Johnson is still running scared of it, but I hope he changes his mind and joins us yes. on the platform tonight. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of leaked documents outlining, outlining initial trade discussions between the UK and US governments. Can the First Minister outline what impact a trade deal like this could have on our NHS? First Minister. Well, a trade deal with the US potentially uh, could open up our health service uh, to private operators. Uh, it could um, lead to an increase in drug prices uh, if there were agreements done with drug companies to, for example, extend patents, uh, something that I believe was uh, mentioned in the paperwork that was leaked yesterday. Uh, that is the risk to our health service if Boris Johnson and the Tories get their way. So I think the priority for people in Scotland over the next couple of weeks is to make sure Boris Johnson doesn't get his way and we get Boris Johnson out of office and protect our national health service. Question number four, Stuart McWillan. Thank you, President. Also, to ask the First Minister what actions the Scottish Government is taking to eliminate violence against women and girls. First Minister. Uh, today is the fourth day of the international 16 days of activism to highlight that violence against women and girls is still too prevalent globally. It serves as a reminder to all of us that each and every part of government, the public sector and wider society has an important role to play in tackling this violence. And I'm sure that the Chamber is united in agreeing that violence against women and girls must become a thing of the past. For the Scottish Government, a progress report on Equally Safe, our strategy to tackle violence against women and girls was published on Monday, setting out recent actions. These include the implementation of our uh, domestic abuse legislation, our support for frontline services and our improvement work across a range of settings. In addition, yesterday we introduced new legislation on improving forensic medical uh, services for victims of rape and sexual assault. Jim McMillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply and the First Minister will be aware that uh, Zero Tolerance referenced a survey carried out by Women's Support Project that indicates that disabled women are twice as likely to experience men's violence as non-disabled women. Uh, statistics also show that BME women and trans women are also at a higher risk of experiencing gender-based violence. Can the First Minister provide assurances that groups of women and girls who are thought to be more at risk of male violence will receive the targeted support that they actually require? First Minister. Well, can I thank Stuart McMillan for raising this issue and, and for raising this particular aspect of the issue. We should never stop being shocked at the violence that is perpetrated against women. And all of us uh, should be aware that along with their gender, women and girls have other protected characteristics that can increase their level of risk of experiencing both violence and abuse. Uh, our Equally Safe strategy recognises that and we are also funding initiatives to target support at particular groups. Uh, we've got to continue to ensure that our efforts are targeted at tackling men's violence against women and be very clear that all forms of violence uh, are a fundamental violation of human rights and will not and must not be tolerated. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister may be aware today of BBC research um, which was published that shows that violence during consensual sex is becoming normal, normalised. 
Um, we need to challenge this attitude within Scotland and to do that we need to invest properly in preventative work. Rate Crisis Scotland estimate that by 2020 they will deliver a programme in 48% of secondary schools and I understand that Mentor and Violence Prevention Programme is currently delivering in 25 local authorities. These figures are encouraging but can I ask when all young people will receive proper preventative programmes? First Minister. Well, can I thank Claire Baker for raising this issue because I, I think this issue is an issue of uh, acute concern. Uh, she described it, and I think rightly, as the normalisation of violence within uh, consensual uh, sex and, and sexual relationships. I uh, have also, as I'm sure many people have, have been alarmed at some of the, uh, and I don't want to uh, tread into matters of uh, criminal justice here uh, or decisions of independent courts, but the, the use of defences uh, in criminal court cases um, about uh, violence being part of consensual sex. So I, I, and there is a real danger here that younger women uh, are encouraged to see that as something that they uh, have to accept as part of a, a consensual sexual relationship. So I think there is a, a really big uh, issue here uh, to make sure that young women in particular have the information and the awareness um, and the education. Claire Baker is right to talk about the importance of education in schools and that has to be part uh, of the routine uh, education around relationships and sexual health. Um, and we will continue to consider, in addition to the programmes that are already uh, taken forward in schools, what more we can do to focus on that particular issue. Question number five, Jamie Green. Thank you. Uh, to ask the First Minister what action <clears throat> the Scottish Government is taking to address the reported £3 billion backlog in road maintenance repairs. First Minister. Uh, responsibility for local roads maintenance lies with local authorities. The majority of funding to local authorities from the Scottish Government is via block grant. We don't stipulate how they should utilise their allocations, uh, but in 2019-20 uh, we're delivering a funding package of £11.2 billion for local authorities, uh, which is a real terms increase of £310 million. Uh, the Scottish Government invested £470 million in managing, maintaining and operating the Scottish Trunk Road Network in 2019-20, which is an increase of £33 million on the year before. Uh, and we have also invested significantly in the motorway network, uh, as evidenced through the recent completion of both the AWPR and the M73 and M74 projects. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the uh, First Minister for the update? Last week, the Rural Economy Committee wrote to the Transport Secretary expressing concern over the state of Scotland's roads. And it was clear that on current funding levels, this problem is only going to get worse. Uh, the First Minister talked about local road maintenance, but the reality is there is a £1.2 billion backlog of trunk road maintenance, roads which are under direct responsibility of the Scottish Government. Starting off, so poor road condition, it's not just an inconvenience to drivers, but it's also a serious safety issue to cyclists, motorcyclists and other users. Uh, the First Minister will be pleased to know that the UK Government has committed to invest an additional £2 billion towards potholes, of which £176 million will come to Scotland. So, First Minister, can you confirm, can you confirm if this money will be directly invested in road maintenance? But more importantly, when can we expect this huge backlog of repairs to be dealt with so that Scotland's roads are finally fit for purpose? First Minister. Well, th these are serious issues. These issues are raised with me by my constituents, as I'm sure they are by the constituents of every member in this chamber. That's exactly why uh, the Scottish Government delivered the increases in funding that I mentioned in my first answer. I may point out, of course, that the Conservatives voted against uh, those increases in funding uh, in our budget. And, of course, uh, the Scottish Conservatives urged us, instead of investing in road maintenance and public services like health and education, to give a tax cut to the wealthiest yeah. in our country, which would have yeah. taken even more money yeah. out of our budget. And in terms of the so-called additional money promised uh, by the Conservative Party, I noticed uh, that Jimmy Green uh, said we're going to get £176 million, apparently. Well, you know, I welcome any extra money that comes from UK governments, but that has to be set against the £1.5 billion that will be taken out of our, in real terms, uh, that our budget will lose next year compared to at the, end, the start of this decade. The Tories have taken money out of Scotland's budget. Uh, they would want to take even more out with their tax cuts for the riches, which makes it a bit galling when week after week they come here asking for more money to be spent on all sorts of things. Maybe the Tories should focus on stopping robbing Scotland's budget before they come and raise these issues here. Question number six. 
Monica Lennon. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to reassure patients and families of the safety of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital and Royal Hospital for Children. First Minister. Well, I would uh, again express my sympathies to patients and families affected by the infection incidents at the Queen Elizabeth and the Royal Hospital for Children. Uh, the Health Secretary has herself met with a number of affected families and patients and is in correspondence with others. On the 4th of October, she appointed Professor Craig White to be a single point of contact for families to lead work to ensure that issues they raise are considered and that they receive responses, information and support as necessary. In addition, as I've already uh, covered uh, earlier on in this session, uh, on 22nd of November, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde was escalated to stage four of the government's performance framework so that we can be more closely involved in oversight of infection prevention and control, clinical governance and patient and family communication. Monica Lennon. Thank you. Today, the First Minister encouraged whistleblowers to speak out. Anna Sarber has just informed her of more new and extremely serious information that has been passed to him. So it's no wonder that parents and the public fear a cover-up. We still don't even know if all of the families whose children have been affected have been notified. It's obvious that parents lost trust in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde long ago, but this government was slow to act and has allowed the board's leadership to remain in post. Surely she must see that this is no longer tenable. First Minister. Oh, well, I, I think I've made very clear, uh, not just today, but in uh, previous sessions when we've been discussing these serious issues, that the government treats these issues with the utmost seriousness. And there is an absolute determination uh, to make sure that we understand and get to the bottom of all of the issues here and that parents have the information and the answers to the questions that they want. Uh, that's why we have taken the action we have taken. Um, the escalation of Greater Glasgow and Clyde is the right and appropriate action to take here and the oversight board will be able to uh, ensure that these particular issues uh, where we consider greater oversight is required uh, are properly monitored. Um, over and above that, of course, as I've already mentioned uh, on more than one occasion today, the independent review and the public inquiry are crucial parts uh, of the process of making sure that uh, parents do get the answers to the questions they have. In the meantime, as I said in my uh, initial answer to Monica Lennon, uh, Professor Craig White is a single point of contact for any uh, parent who feels that there are answers they could get now that they're not getting to make sure uh, that that provision of information is there. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Mr. Neil Findlay. President officer, can I ask if you have had a request from the government for a statement to be made on the appointment of the chair of the new Scottish Investment Bank? I'm sure you will agree this is a very important appointment and there are reports in the media that the chair appointed by the First Minister and Finance Secretary moved his company from Edinburgh to Bermuda for tax purposes and was then fined £8.6 million, a record at that time, uh, by a uh, fine by regulators for a conflict of interest case. Now, this is a very important appointment and should be subject to scrutiny by this parliament. So can I ask if the government has asked you for time for a statement to be made on this very important appointment? Can I thank Mr. Finlay uh, for the point of order? Uh, no request has been made as far as I'm aware, certainly not through the Parliamentary Bureau, but I would suggest to Mr. Finlay that the option is open to him through his business manager to raise it through the Parliamentary Bureau and it will be considered as would any other part of parliamentary business. Thank you very much and on that note we're going to conclude First Minister's questions and we're going to move on shortly to members business in the name of Tom Arthur on St Andrew's Day but we'll just take a, a, a moment we'll actually suspend business for a few moments just to allow uh, new members of the gallery to come through and ministers to change seats. A short suspension.